if it's in a landscape where the whole county is CRP and nobody's grazing, then it would really help if some of them would start grazing and maybe even graze fairly heavy. Whereas if you were in a landscape where everyone is grazing heavily, it would be nice to have some that's either not grazed or lightly grazed or, or periodically grazed. This episode of Voices from the Field continues a conversation between Dr. Sam Fuhlendorf of Oklahoma State University and INCAT grazing specialist Linda Poole about using grazing to bolster, rather than unintentionally harm, desirable wildlife on farms and ranches. Many regenerative ranchers use mob grazing, which is dense herds of livestock grazing a place for a very brief time before moving on, to increase grass production and improve soil health. It's been a successful strategy for graziers around the world, but often also affects bird populations and other wildlife. Sam and Linda talk about the role of fire in range management and the positive effect it can have on wildlife. They also discuss applying range management strategies, both on smaller operations and regionally. Let's listen. Where, where we start, where anybody starts, but especially our listeners who a lot of times are beginning farmers or ranchers or people with smaller properties, they have an off, uh, you know, an off farm job that takes a lot of their time. They might not have time to do this intensive grazing. They might care about wildlife. They're trying to blend all these moving pieces. You know, I always, I always talk about regenerative grazing. You have at least six balls in the air all the time. And, right. and if you can keep even three of them up there and not hitting you on the head, you're doing pretty good. And so what I was hoping you might touch on now, Sam, is the idea of if you have a smaller property, how would you think about that? If you're a small property among many properties that are similar size or like my place in Montana, I have a half section and that's basically a half of a postage stamp compared to the size of operations around me. And so how can we take this principle of heterogeneity helping helping your land and helping your livestock and definitely helping the wildlife? How can we blend that with the reality of we have a a small property, or maybe people have large, maybe that's where you'd like to start. You know, before we recorded the podcast, you were telling me about a Spanish land grant property in Texas that got you to thinking about it. Could you maybe start with that story and then help us think about smaller properties? Sure, sure. The The story is that in South Texas, it's a large coastal prairie and there's hardly any of it left, but these people had, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was close to 10,000 or so acres and they want to graze it, but they don't want to, they're, they're not in the business. They do want to make money off of grazing, but that it's not their total livelihood. And so they were, they're lightly stocked and they want to keep it as a large pasture. And one of the challenges was that when they went to the NRCS to see about getting uh, cost share money for an invasive plant that was taken over a woody plant, they were told that the only way they could get funding, and this was quite a few years ago, was to impose a, a high density, rapid rotational grazing system. And so I was saying earlier that my concern is not that they shouldn't do that I and mean, they should do whatever they want to do, but they, ought, they should not be forced into one size fits all because objectives are different for lots of and, landowners. And I think that's a good point about your land holding size is that that's an important variable that change what a person's objective may be off of their property. And it greatly changes the way uh, you might want to manage. And if, if I can just quickly go back to prairie chickens, you know, we've, I've been in discussions where we've talked that what does a prairie chicken population needs need? And I guess the smallest number that's often thrown around is 50,000 acres. Oftentimes, it's up to 100,000 acres for a viable population of prairie chickens. Well, you know, there's not many people that own that much land. And so that means that you almost have to have multiple landowners and consider larger scale issues associated with that. And that's one of the things that I've tried to argue. And in fact, in some of the stuff we've written, tried to say the first thing is to take this landscape perspective. That's probably the most important thing that you can do. 
and I guess I would say I was uh, an example I was asked one time was, uh, should we grace CRP? So there's a conservation reserve program, uh, perennial grass planted back on highly erodible land. And could it be better if we grazed it? Well, I was asked that question and my answer was, well, it depends on what the surrounding landscape is done. So essentially, if it's in a landscape where the whole county is CRP and nobody's grazing, then it would really help if some of them would start grazing and maybe even graze fairly heavy. Whereas if you were in a landscape where everyone is grazing heavily, it would be nice to have some that's either not grazed or lightly grazed or, or periodically grazed. And similarly, the thing that I think I see happening in some parts of the country is that we're uniformly applying the same management to the middle. And that's a danger from a landscape perspective because we actually need a little more of this messy uh, management where, where there are some places that are heavily grazed and some places that are ungrazed. The hard thing about doing that with multiple landowners is that you know one thing about the shifting mosaic is that ideally what gets heavily grazed isn't the same place every year. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you move into a landscape context and you say, well, okay, you know, Mr. Smith versus grazes heavy every year and Mrs. Jones grazes lightly. So we're good from a landscape context. Well, the heavily grazed place is just going to degrade and, you know, you've got a risk of losing long-term potential productivity. But if you could get that to shift around, I think that's positive. And in fact, Sometimes I think our, even our programs that we make to help solve some of these problems, like prairie chicken programs, I know early on they were trying to get just grazing reduced, and I was worried that we might get woody plant encroachment with minimal grazing and no fire on those places that are really necessity for nesting cover. Mm -hmm. So I guess to get back to your question with 300 acres, I guess, or, or thereabouts, my suggestion for what would be the most useful from a regional conservation strategy is that you do on that acreage what others are not doing on their 320 acres mm -hmm. and help create heterogeneity among landowners. But another point that we've talked about is that large areas have more heterogeneity. The smaller your area, the less heterogeneity it's going to have. That's all, almost, a, if there's any heterogeneity principles, that would be one. Mm -hmm. And so you can't have as much on a small piece of property as you can have on a large piece of property is sort of the take home, which landscape ecology and fragmentation and all of that science agrees with that, that that's important. But I do think you can still manage that way. And if you're interested in plant diversity, then you can even create a patchwork within 300 acres. And in fact, we've done this sort of patch grazing stuff all the way down to 100 acre pastures and found positive effects. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing that, were you using fire in that system or did you do it all with grazing? That was that included fire in that example, um, mm -hmm. because part of the objective was to stop woody plant encroachment of eastern red cedar. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm I'm really intrigued with the question of fire, given given what's going on and trying to build soil health so that we can moderate climate extremes, catch and hold more water in our soils. You know, we we really think about conserving our litter and having it be incorporated into the soil and building our soil organic matter. And, you know, I think about fire and it's like, it eats that stuff. Uh -huh. And so I, I really wonder about, about, you know, how do you make decisions about whether you should be burning or are there, are there ways to, to change your fire, your um, burn prescription so that it has less impact on fire? Or is it something where you need the more extreme effects of fire? You know, I, I know that a lot of our prescribed fire are cool out of season burns. That's not, <laughs> that's not the way that that it right. would be burned in the past. You know, it's another Fred Provenza thing that I, I that he told me that I, I think about almost daily. You know, it's like we think that we know 
yeah. that in the past fires burned hot and because they were they were burning with you know livestock or with uh, lightning strikes in in dry seasons and we think we know that native americans would have would may have favored a drier or a cooler creeping burn but he he says you know things never were the way they were and they never will be again and what we need to recognize is that yes it's great to be informed by the ecological history of our land and the variability that we see but what's in front of us is probably very different than what's behind us and so given given that how do we make decisions and and i i look at my little place here and as we're we're in a horrible drought in montana parts of montana are flooding and washing away and a little bit is okay but some of us are still really really droughty it's about 103 degrees here it's uh, july the 13th when we're recording this and you know, I can I can see the places where I have more litter. I have greener grass over the top of it, but I also have a lot of little baby sagebrush coming in. And I want some sagebrush, but do I want everything to go to sagebrush? And fire seems like the solution to sagebrush. And it's like, how how do you recommend people? make these decisions? Is there a thought process that you would suggest we go through to decide, you know, to burn or not to burn, to graze more intensively or not? You know, how do we decide? And then how do we tell if it's working? You know, what type of monitoring might we do? Sure. And, and I think that's, that, that's a very insightful question. And I, and I, uh, I, I do agree with Fred. I honestly think that I mean, there's a few things we know about historically, but most there's a lot more that we don't know and, and we'll never know. And, and honestly, like you said, I'm not sure that it really matters. We're not going back to 1491 yeah. and, and I'm not sure that we want, would want to even if we could. But uh, the thing that I go back to is the greatest change that we're observing according to expert opinion, which, you know, you might like or dislike, but the dominant change on rangelands is the increase in woody plants. And the dominant practice on rangeland for the last 100 years has been fire suppression. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I am not suggesting a fire is a cure-all. In fact, some places we can have too much fire. That doesn't happen very often, but it, it can. And I don't think it's a cure-all, but if there was an interest in thinking more about fire, where I would start, there's some great uh, work that's been done that looks at the historical fire, but there's, and that's one place. So like tree ring data, charcoal data in lakes, there's really good data from that. But then you can also get into uh, uh, Rich Guyette and Mike Stambaugh from Missouri they developed a map of the U.S. that talked about the chemistry of the plants and let them reveal how much fire they would have likely had. And then they sort of tested that against the, the tree ring data and came up with this really good model that predicts how much fire they say, and I, I say this cautiously, ought to be on the landscape. And I'm not sure they would say ought to be, but maybe that could be supported. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a bit of fire, honestly. So it starts in Texas with a fire every two years. Mm -hmm. And it goes up, say, by the time you get into Canada, it's, you know, 10 to 15 year fire return interval. But uh, and, and when you get in the Rockies, it gets really messy after that. But but I guess I, when the people when people sort of argue against fire from a soil carbon standpoint or a uh, system sustainability standpoint that is where history is fairly valuable the wichita mountains wildlife refuge here they've done an extensive fire studies and basically there's been a fire there for the past 400 years every you know two or three years on each spot hmm. so if it were going to erode away and we were going to and the soil and we were going to lose all the soil carbon then you could go in there and you ought to be able to find that and uh and you can't and in, in fact it's really hard to find places that have been burned very much that have 
reduced soil carbon. Now you can find places that have less total carbon because if you burn up trees, that reduces the amount of carbon, but that wasn't necessarily in the soil. And so uh, some of the discussion of fire is very difficult because it, I say the primary reason is not because of uh, carbon that fire will be difficult to apply. The primary reason is because of culture. Uh -huh. our, our current society and I you know and I, admittedly it's just not something where it's hard for me to imagine seeing you know the western U.S. burn as often as some people think it should in order to make it the way it ought to be and all of those words have a lot of baggage like like uh, uh like you said about Fred Provenza that you know essentially we don't even really know it's it's at best of educated guess Mm -hmm. at what it would have been. But I got interested in fire because really mainly by its interaction with grazing and the attract. That's the other thing is that, well, if fire wasn't a part of these landscapes, then why would all of these species be responding positively to fire? You know, I guess that doesn't mean that that doesn't help you with detailed management other than it just suggests that a big part of the world was fire and uh, many species still respond to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a paper about the butterfly prairie paradox and I don't know if you ran across that, but basically the argument was that a uh, regal fritillary lives in a grassland that has a strong history of a lot of fire, but if you have fires, they, they go away. And so how in the world did you have fire in this grasshopper and still have prairie. You know, you would have had to have had fire to have prairie, and this is in uh, the eastern tall grass prairie region. And the argument I made was, well, yeah, you always had fire, but you also always didn't have fire. Right. Yep. <laughs> you, had, you had heterogeneity, and uh, so it's sort of the same logic. So fire people think I'm I'm trying to say less fire, and people who don't want fire are thinking I'm trying to say more fire. <laughs> It's, I get the same thing, you know, and if I go to a grazing conference, I'm the fire guy. And if I go to a fire conference, I'm the grazing guy. Yeah. And uh, which all of that suits my personality pretty well. But I, I think the point is that there are no cure-alls and all of these things can be destructive or productive. And I do think there's value in looking at the history, but, you know, realistically, historical landscapes weren't trying to sustain beef production enterprises and so that's just different and uh and you know managing it you know i don't think we would want to manage it the way it was managed in 1491. yeah well i i look at lark bundings they're a passerina songbird I, sam knows this but for our listeners they're they're a tweety bird that um that is a, they're a prairie related bird. And it's fascinating because they'll come in in the spring, they migrate and the males will come in first. And it's like they're going around looking at the prairie as if they have these, <laughs> you know, like a monitoring scheme in mind. Right. And, and if it does not look like it's going to be a good enough year, these birds just pack up and they do not nest here. They, they, are, they are nomads. They go where the situation is good. And, you know, to some extent, all of our wildlife used to do that. They, you know, it might have been a small movement between um, various plant communities within a given area, or maybe it's an altitudinal change that they would make depending upon the year that that they have and and now that you know our land is all circumscribed by land deeds i own this place i don't own that place we have to we have to figure out how to do agriculture within our boundaries within 12 months and yeah. it, it, another really good example that so and we 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 published a paper on this but we have a we have a current student working on it again is um, migratory birds. So not even breeding birds that come in and, and stick around, but just as they're going north, mm -hmm. uh, 
one of the things we've observed is that uh, migratory shorebirds have a strong attraction, not to fire, but to fire in the last two weeks. Wow. So you add that to the complexity, not only do you need fire on the landscape, but you need it to have always just happened. <laughs> but they're, they're, they have a strong preference for zero to 14 days since the fire. And then they'll use some of the other fires, but they, they don't select them near as strongly. And one of the things we're trying to do is find out why that is. Other things that we've done, we, we have a, so you, I talk a lot about pyric herbivory, which is grazing animals that are attracted to burned areas. Mm -hmm. uh, fire, it, the official definition is formed by fire. So herbivory that's formed by fire. So mm -hmm. it's sort of the logic. Well, Tori Hovick from North Dakota, when he was a student here, he did, uh, we have a paper called Pyric Carnivory, and it's about raptors and how Ooh. raptors use ongoing fires to hunt. Oh, yeah. And, and I'm sure you've seen that before. And, uh, and how they, you know, they can be almost absent from a landscape and you light it on fire and they just come in, you know, uh, really quickly. So... I like to talk about fire and grazing interacting, but in reality, there's also some other benefits of fire other than just killing woody plants associated. And, and, the, and I, I guess I've always sort of argued if these species have these positive signatures that they're responding to, then that suggests to me that it's not their, at least genetically speaking, it's not their first fire. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I think that a lot of our listeners will be familiar with if you if you are somebody who does tillage or even if you're just haying, you know, you, yeah. you turn on the tractor, you go out there and all of a sudden there's a flock of gulls. Yeah. yeah. You know, right behind you. And if if that doesn't happen everywhere, it's happened everywhere that I've ever lived yeah. Um, yeah, in the western sure. US. And and there are lots of lots of different levels of organization and, you know, the way animals interact across their landscape, fine scale and larger scale interactions. Don't have time to stay up to date on the freshest sustainable agriculture news, events and funding opportunities? You can trust NCAT to keep you connected with our weekly harvest e-newsletter. Subscribe today at NCAT.org and get your weekly harvest delivered each Wednesday. You know, one thing that I wanted to come back with before we end, Sam, is the idea of how do we define success? How do we tell if what we're doing is meeting goals? If we are a grazier who is who also wants to make sure that we're providing quality wildlife habitat, you know, how might we go about that in a way that we could afford? Maybe it's, maybe it's to form a, a relationship with, uh, you know, the American Bird Conservancy or, you know, right. or, you know, Audubon or somebody to come and look at this, but not everybody has that, <laughs> you know, has that advantage. And especially those of us with smaller properties, Right, so, right. You know, I guess it's, I guess it's like, how do we tell if it's working? But any advice that you have for us who have smaller properties or are just starting into this idea of, of wildlife habitat as part of our agriculture? So, so one of the things, so I've been really fortunate to work with Bob Hamilton at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve and, mm -hmm. and on cattle and on bison. And, uh, and we've played around with that as well because you know and and even with different uh agencies you know if they have a lot of land how in the world do you monitor all that land and and then of course if you're a rancher you're you're wanting uh to just know whether you need to modify your management but but with bob uh one of the things we've done that i really like and we're we're kind of working on this now is and and i would love to see if it works elsewhere is to go in and, and I am not against, I think it's important to monitor plants and, and soils as well. So I'm not saying that you throw all that out the window, but I think there's a lot of people have discussed how to monitor rangelands for those things. What mm -hmm. I really like from a bird standpoint 
And some of this is doable because we've done so much work at the preserve, but I think you could find it for lots of areas is to find some species that seem to be a little bit sensitive and maybe they're at the ends of the gradient. So one or two that likes heavily grazed areas and one or two that likes ungrazed or, or like thick brush or, you know, as you described earlier <laughs> and, uh, and learn those birds and then just make sure you have those extreme ones on the landscape because the middle ones will probably do fine. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, we've kind of noticed this Henslow Sparrow, which, you know, requires rank old grass and upland sandpipers, which uh, like some of the more intensively disturbed areas, but they also use larger landscapes that, you know, include other plant communities. And we've sort of played around and are working it on extending it further, but the idea that if we can monitor and know that we have those two species, then we're pretty sure everything's intact. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to learn the whole bird community, you know, it's a little bit easier to focus on a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so people could learn about what those species might be by interacting with who would you recommend the, the, you know, with Bob Hamilton, it's the Nature Conservancy, Audubon comes to mind. Right, and the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. I mean, there's a bunch of those organizations, or even if there's a, you know, the State Wildlife Agency, if you can find, it's all about the individual, if you can find the right person that really knows and really uh, is interested in the, the concept of, uh, I've really wanted, to look at global project of using birds to actually monitor rangelands in general, because I really think they're, they're very useful in a lot of ways. Uh, they integrate across scales even uh, often. They, you know, I mean, people sample birds for free, so, <laughs> so it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> True. If you, if you find the right people. And, and so I do think getting with some of those groups, which are probably more uh, common in some areas than others, but, uh, mm -hmm. but it would be interesting. And, I, and I, I would love to see a lot of regenerative grazing people get more interested in trying to find some of these uh, you know, uh, other ways of monitoring as well as the ones they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Uh know that quite a few of our listeners do not have the benefit of being Westerners like we are. And, and they're probably listening. If they're still hanging in there on this podcast, it's like, are you ever going to say something that's directly applicable to me <laughs> in a place that, you know, where it is green and where there are some trees? So I wonder if these principles that you have about heterogeneity and, and shifting mosaics, you know, spatial patterning, what is the way that that would interact if you were back east or down south where it actually is is green? <laughs> I mean, I, it's so foreign to me, I can't imagine it. But, you know, principles usually apply broadly. So what about this stuff we've been talking about? Yeah, they, they do apply. And in fact, there are some eastern uh, extension people. Some of them are in ag and some are in wildlife that are talking about these sorts of things as well. I, I think quickly of some people at the University of Tennessee that, uh, that are talking these same kinds of practices and actually monitoring those. Uh, there's some ongoing work in Florida as well. Gosh, I'm brain dead right now. Uh, through the Archibald Biological Station, which mm -hmm. they have the, they have an agricultural station as well. And they, They've done some of this, and I just saw that they recently published a paper that I haven't read yet, but uh, it definitely works. In fact, I point to, uh, other than Native Americans, who clearly we stole this idea from almost entirely, <laughs> uh, the first people I know of that showed this information in the research literature was from the southeast forest lands where they used fires to draw animals out to corners of large pastures. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it did work. 
Oh, okay. for hunting. So they were, yeah. it was, it was creating a place where your hunting could be more efficient. Exactly. And so I, I think there's information out there. And one thing I would point people to, if you're interested, a recent project that we have is called the Prairie Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that. I read a little about it. I'd love to hear more. Okay. And, and let me just drop a promotion. I didn't do it, but I, my colleagues did the uh, web page and it's got under resources, one of them is this patch burn heterogeneity <laughs> sort of thing, and I'm not sure what it was called, but in that is a map of the US and each button you click on goes to a paper. Mm -hmm. So it's a, an accumulation of all the literature, at least up to a couple of years ago. Wow. And, um, and so that's really useful. And then there's a lot on multi-species grazing as well. And, but the Prairie Project was funded by USDA and it was a sustainable ag systems grant where from Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, we argued that the greatest threat to uh, livestock in that region is the encroachment of woody plants. And, we're, and we've argued that. And in fact, it's also written into a recent paper and we argued that the most sustainable solutions are this patch fire and or multi-species grazing with the idea that they wanted us to talk about not only livestock production, we, we had to talk about that. And in fact, we're supposed to talk about how to increase livestock production by 20%. Hmm. And so we, we're working on that. But then in addition, they wanted other ecosystem services. And so we partnered, we have um, 10 or 15 ranches that are on the main, uh, uh, on our main tier of collaborators, and we're collecting data off those ranches, but we also have research stations. And then the intent is, I guess we've just entered in year four, and it's a five-year project right in the middle of COVID. So that's been awkward because a lot of it was going to be about meeting people, everyone getting together. And we haven't been able to do that so as much we've done some of it but the idea is to find a way to sustain and enhance production in the face of changing things like like the weather as well as encroachment of woody plants and uh it's led to uh a lot of discussions that probably needed to happen a long time ago you know part of our area is in Southwest Texas and they don't really have that as much fuel. So it's a lot harder to burn. So they're more interested in the multi-species grazing. Whereas if you go to the Flint Hills of Kansas, goats are, uh, you know, evil, mm -hmm. and, but they, bur they burn everything all the time. They have a culture of fire and that's not really a problem. So ultimately what we hope to do is get all of these groups together and we've already done some of that and start talking about collective. I think one of the disservices of our research and uh, is that we tend to parse things too much. So, oh, so woody plants are a problem. So let's figure out how to kill woody plants. Well, if you don't figure out how to integrate that into the main land use objective of producing livestock in, you know, in that example or having wildlife, then it's not very useful. So I've really tried to ask questions that are relevant to ranch level decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think this grant is an attempt to do that across those four states. Wow, that is so encouraging to hear of that work and, and the idea of integrating things in a practical way and looking at unintended consequences and, protect, and potentially unintended benefits right, right. Of, of the work that you're doing. And because you are integrating grazing with fire, uh, you're already ahead of a lot of us in having a more balanced approach, a more integrative approach to, to what's happening on the land. I keep thinking about, can we learn to do things quickly enough? You know, the faster, the faster we, can, we can adapt to the situations around us, the better our outcomes will be and the better positioned we are going to be financially and honestly, you know, just emotionally, mentally, spiritually, you know, if we can adapt to what's coming, 
towards us, uh, it's going to be better all the way around. Well, so how do we as technical assistance providers at NCAT and you and universities, well, how do we help position people so they can do this and integrative research that, you know, asks real life questions at a scale and at a cost that is appropriate. You know, I think that's so important and often missing. I agree entirely. And I think things like, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket or, you know, that kind of thing emerges when you actually look at the entire system. So, you know, if you're only interested in killing trees, then there's no discussion about, well, where do you do that? And where do you not do that? And, you know, if you're interested in, well, I, I need to still make money off of livestock. So now I'm interested in killing trees. That makes it a more complex question. But if you say, well, I'm interested in uh, producing livestock, having good water, having uh, wildlife diversity, now it starts to get to be a really fun question that uh, that requires a lot more discussion. And, and I guess that's one of the things I kind of like about the whole patch fire thing is that I do think that probably its greatest contribution is that it's, it's one management approach that integrates a lot of problems into uh, sort of a management objective. And I think that's in the spirit of what regenerative ag is trying to do as well. I couldn't agree more. You know, I just, I, I think how to, how to balance and integrate and how to tell early on whether you're headed in the right direction or headed to a train wreck. <laughs> You know, right. it's, it's right. not easy. It's not easy to know that sometimes. No. And I think one of the principles, I, I think there's two principles that I kind of work on. And one is that diversity is a hedge against all sorts of mistakes. Right. You know, if, if I make a big mistake in this, maybe this other thing can help deal with it. And another is to try as much as I can to set it up so that nature nature can do the work for me, you know, right. that, that it's in tune with, you know, that what I'm doing is in tune with what I think nature is doing or is about to do. And uh, I, I don't know this person, I heard it on a, on a webinar from, from the Netherlands, supposedly there's someone, Bill Hill, a European person, if I heard the name right, but uh the quote that I keep remembering is we will succeed in agriculture when we get over trying to kill everything that wants to live and support, you know, try to boost up everything that wants to die. It's, you know, it's just, it's so common sense and it's not easy to do, you know, tr stop trying to kill things that want to live. Well, some of those things, when we come back to trees, those trees want to live, but, you know, is that something that, that we can think about how to deal with in an integrated way? Anyway, I, well, I just have to say thank you so much for, for this wonderful discussion. You know, it feels to me like an opening a door to, to a huge number of other things that are important to us as graziers. And I hope we can go forward with, with more discussions on this, Sam. But as, as we leave, do you have any parting words or suggestions for our listeners? No, I don't. I, don't, I can't think of anything incredibly smart that I would like to say at the end of a great podcast. So I think I should just shut up. Uh, <laughs> But, but I, uh, I am really, really grateful and I really enjoyed this and I really would love the opportunity to interact with, with others about this and, and continue to move forward. So uh, if, if there's ever any way I can help out or, or interact, um, I would be more than pleased to, to participate. Uh, well, we will totally take you up on that. You might, you might regret that I have that recorded <laughs> so I can hold your toes to the fire. Sam, great. you promised. <laughs> hey, great. Yeah. Well, this, this has been such a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. And we'll be back with another podcast next week with the Atra podcast series. And thank you for listening in. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts.
I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.